Joining us in the studio today is Stu Marseille. We're here to talk about his brand new book, and it's absolutely fantastic, The Inside Secrets to Building and Timber Pest Inspections. Stu, good morning. Hi, Mark. Now, Stu, you have been in the game for how long? 27 years. 27 years. You must know what you're talking about by now. I, I hope so, with uh, being a chartered surveyor and also an ex-university lecturer in and building studies. how many houses do you think you've inspected over that 27 years? Thousands and thousands. And people are still missing some of the obvious things that you might say. Well, they don't know what they don't know. Invariably, when you go look around a property, you're looking for how many bedrooms, what's the yard like, has it got a pool? Yeah. You're not even considering what defects there might be. So firstly, Stu, you've got a list of about 10 important items people should be looking out for. Now, the first on your list is the durable notice. Now, is this method in where inspectors determine if there's any current or past termite management in place? What does that mean? That's correct. In a standard property, you have a durable notice, which is either in the meter box or under the kitchen sink. And that will tell you what is protecting the property so whether it's a chemical or baiting system or something that's actually fixed within the wall. And then we can determine, the first place you go is have a look at that. We can determine whether the property is, is protected or whether there has been a termite management system and whether it's expired or not, because there's costs involved and risk. So tell us how concrete floor slabs abutting one another can be a bit of a problem. Well, if it's called a monolithic slab, which is where the slab's been poured as one, and that includes your patios and your external extremities of the property, there's a lesser risk there because there's no, there's a cold joint is where you have one concrete slab poured and then another slab poured against it. And you have to have a termite management system within the actual joint because if you don't and, and there's a gap of over a millimetre, then termites could and do gain access to the property. I guess you just assume too that because it's concrete, there couldn't be a termite problem, right? Well, that's right, but... The, your, t your durable notice will also tell you, it will say perimeter and penetrations. Now, penetrations are your waste and your services that pass through the floor, so you have to protect those as well. So when you're looking at a property, invariably the durable notice will tell you who fit it, what the chemical constituency of it is, when it was done, how long it lasts, and whether it's perimeter, uh, columns, uh, cold joints and the like. So you get a good idea of when you look at that, if you've got an extension of the property or additions and it's not mentioning those, it's a high probability that that's a bit of a Heath Robinson job maybe and it's not protected and therefore at risk. So what about baiting systems? Well, a baiting system is a proprietary system that runs around the perimeter of a property. And then little boxes that have sacrificial timber in them, which is full of lacreous, the sugars of which the termites like and want to eat. So... When they're foraging, they'll go to these boxes. The termite management company, who you've employed to look after them, will come out three weeks, four weeks, six weeks, well, whatever they determine as being the high risk, and they'll check these boxes. If there's termite activity in them, they will treat them. Termites talk through pheromones, through their spittle between each other. So they then talk through their pheromones. That then passes all the way back to the queen and kills the queen. Okay, Stu, what about timber extensions and additions to buildings? I'm sure there's going to be plenty you come across that are a problem. Yes. Uh, most individuals, uh, if, if, if they've employed their friends and their pals and they've built small extensions and porchways and such like on or some of the older properties that prior to anybody really concerning themselves with pup sticking a laundry on the back of the property, you find this timber in contact with ground and no termite management system. And the older you, the further back you go, the, the timbers are treated and they use the steel termite capping. But where you've got timber in contact with ground, that's a perfect environment for, for termites to gain access. And hardwood properties are certainly more resilient because they don't have the lacreous and natural sugars that are in there that the termites are after. But they're still at risk as well from an a termite having a nibble at it, but the softwood is what they really go for and it can do a considerable amount of damage in a short space of time. Okay, so what about the structure and finishing elements, Stu? For instance, uh, walls and roof. Yeah, well, what we're looking at with, with the context of your walls, what are they? So are they, are they just are they timber and weatherboarding or timber clad? Is it timber internal frame? Is it brick external clad? Is it solid? Is it solid or hollow core block with concrete filled or solid brick? And that then determines when you're looking at the structural elements as to what, if there's any structural cracking or movement, 
you're following what may or may not be causing the issue. It's called follow the trail. You might see some fine hairline cracks in render, and invariably the render coating is very thin compared to the brick and the block work, so you get what's called differential movement, which is the brick and the block work expand and contract differently to you know three or four or six millimeter render. So it might just be that it's just thermal expansion and contraction, and it's a re- and it's just the render that's cracked. If you've seen anything over three or five millimeters, and you can get your pencil in, and it's step cracking with the brickwork, then you've got to determine: is it on a raft foundation? Or is it on a on a, a traditional footing with an infill slab, and that's where modern properties are laid on a slab. You see the big, you can actually see the slab at the on the outer section where the, it's, there's a, a little r- line that runs around the outside of the property, and that's actually the top of the slab. All the properties are on a footing on a foundation. Now, if you've got trees around, and you've got uh, very thirsty trees, they can then undermine the foundations and cause structural cracking and movement. And that leads on to when I'm looking at a property and I go underneath, if it's on a, if it's on steel or timber uh, poles and I'm going underneath and there's a lot of runoff of water running underneath the property, then I'm looking to see whether there's any washout around the poles and the foundations. So that would then lead me to say, well, we need some, some agri-drain, some land drainage, around, redirect the flow of water. And it's quite often that I see rutting, which is like corrugation underneath the, the property, and that's where the water's been running. And then you can see the washout around this. And also, if you've got high ground level, so the ground level on the external part of the property is higher than the finished floor level, and the external wall hasn't been tanked or waterproofed properly, you can get a migration of moisture coming through the wall, manifesting itself on the inside. Say, for example, a garage. If you go in a garage and you see a tide mark and there's white salts deposited on the surface, they're called efflorescence. The water comes through, as it evaporates, deposits the salts. Now, if you imagine if you were to get a uh, pitcher of salt, pot it out on your bench top at the night. When you came back in the morning, it was set solid. That's kind of what happens with it. It sits on the surface, but it's called hygroscopic. It absorbs the moisture. You've got some migration of moisture here. Yes, we've had it dug out, waterproofed. Here's the paperwork. Right, so we know that's been fixed and we've got a, we've got a, we can follow the trail with that. But where they, the hygroscopic salts, are, uh, the efflorescence rather, sat on the surface, they give the appearance, if you're using your moisture meter and, and such like, uh, that it's damp when it's not actually, it's just absorbing the moisture from the, the atmosphere. So you've really got to know what you're looking at, what's happened, and follow the paper trail if there is any. If there isn't, then it's probably current, and there's quite a lot of expenditure if you're looking at penetrating damp within buildings. So, Stu, I suppose uh, floor slabs, timber floors, they have their issues too. They do. Uh, if we take a concrete floor slabs, in a modern property designed by an engineer, so it should be okay, certified, got your, your certificate of occupancy. Older properties with additions, I invariably find that the concrete floor slabs not to code, uh, not to a good standard, and you can get hogging and sagging. And hogging is where the floor raises because of the it might be the acidic compound, uh, uh, combination of the, of, the, of the ground which attacks the concrete and so you get hogging or sagging where the soil, the, if we're looking at a bit of runoff of water underneath and it's not com- being compacted properly, we can end up with sagging. And when you get the hogging and sagging, then you're looking at uh, and, and a lot of deterioration of a floor slab. The only real thing to do there is, is, to, is to, you know, significant remedial action with it. Also, I don't, I don't like the word significant when you're talking about <laughs> repairing something that sounds very Cost, serious. Very costly, yeah. yeah. So, Stu, what about if you live on the side of a hill, uh, for example, Budrum? What should you be aware of in a situation like that? Well, you're looking, uh, A, is there plenty of uh, retainers and retention to, you know, to hold the, the earth and the banking in place? What sort of retainers are they? Are they timber? Most people will look at a timber retaining wall, and even if they're a lay person, they'll give it a little tap and think it's okay. But the actual supporting posts, they, the fungal decay takes place just below the surface, like a little kid's milk tooth. It just you know, it rots away underneath, so it can appear to be okay, but not. Also on the surface might, of the actual fence panels, the sleepers may feel solid, but it's more than likely if it's 10, if it's 10 or, or plus years old that there's a, a pretty high percentage that most of the meat in the back of that retainer will have gone already. And that's where you need to use your screwdrivers and your braddles and things to braddle around and see if you can find, if or, or or if there's any if they're out of vertical alignment. Timber fences or retainers usually the water will run through the gaps and get away. If you've got more of a brick or a block work 
uh, wall and there's no weep holes, the little weep holes or the little drainage holes in. Because all, all the weight is from the water generally. Yeah. And yeah. there's what's called an angle of repose, which is if you draw a 45 degree angle from the bottom of the back of the wall up to, up to, to fit, you know, where you come out of the ground, that's where the load is. That's the most load of that 45 degree angle, angle repose. So you have to keep that in consideration of how big is the wall to how much, how much load is it carrying. So you want to make sure you've got plenty of retainers you want to be looking at agri drain and land drainage and direct the water away from not so it's not running out your property. But also, you can't just send it anywhere. You can't send it across into your neighbours. So that's going to be consideration of where can you send it to, how can you send it, how, how are you going to manage that, and also if you've got a lot of greenery and trees and and shrubs and bushes etc. You can't just take them out on a hill because that's what's holding the, all the soil together. That's what holds it together. So if you're coming and think, oh, we're going to strip all this stuff out, we're going to do this, that, and the other, you've got to take professional advice from arboriculturists and, and engineers before you start doing anything that might cause an undermining of your property. Now, we did touch briefly on windows and doors earlier, but what sort of issues come up with windows and doors? Well, it's a bit of horses for courses with that. If we take the aluminium sliding windows, vertical sliding sashes and side-hung sashes, the larger the, the, the sliding hung sash is, the more weight the glass. And so with age, the wheels, the little bogies that carry them, they, the wheels go elliptical, rugby ball shaped, and they're difficult to open and close. You can Even if it's an early stage of that, if you open the window and look at the track at the bottom because it's normally painted, if it's silver and you can see the aluminium, then the wheels aren't turning. So you've got to immediately look at that and say, ah, uh, I think, it, you know, and if it's a little bit difficult, then it's getting going to get worse, not better. And and the good news is they're quite, on modern uh, windows, they're quite easy to replace, lift the window out, unscrew them or pop them out, pop some new ones in. The vertical sliding hung sashes, back when I was a carpenter 30 um, <laughs> odd years ago, I used to make those and we used to put the steel weights in. So they're counterweights within yes. the frame. Yes. So the counterweight is the weight of the timber and the glass. So when you open up, they stay where they're supposed to stay, you know, so whatever. In Australia, they favour where you lift them up and there's a little there's a little bracket that slips underneath them and holds them on the old Queenslanders, just yeah. like a little hook. Yes. In the modern aluminium windows, they have a spring in the frame and it's covered by a little plastic tube. And invariably, they, they wear, and when they wear, when you open the window, the window slides back down again. If they've broken all together, when you open the window, it comes back, a, like, back down like a guillotine. Sure. And yes, they're repairable, but it's labour intensive. So if you've got a lot in a property, that's an expense you wouldn't uh, have probably budgeted for. Right. So you've got, I, I check slide hung, vertical, and make sure that I've got a good picture of how many there are, and, and then we can determine. Uh, th through quotations of things, what sort of costs are involved. Timber windows, different again. At, uh, they're at risk, obviously, from, from the weather and atmospherics. Got to keep them in good condition, whether they're painted or they're stained or what, what have you. But they warp and twist a little bit, so bolts and locks don't always catch and, can be, and, they, and they also swell and bind. So there's two separate issues going on there, your metal windows and your timber windows, and you've got to pay particular attention. They do have timber windows with with, with this with the little um, weight with yeah, the springs I, in them. I have yeah. seen them. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, some of the issues are the same. Some are slightly different. Doors, once again, do they open and close? Okay. Any shakes? Any fungal decay with them? Shakes are where they split along the grain. So we're looking for. Yeah, are, do they open and close? Okay. Are they twisted? I, I looked at a property recently with some huge sliding doors, and they, they were just so massive that the, the lady who was buying the property couldn't even slide them back and forth because the wheels were warm because of the weight of the glass. But that's not something you'd think of when you just look walking past and looking at this lo lovely house. Yeah, yeah. So it's those sorts of issues you look at. Serviceability and, and also are, are they okay now or are, are, they on the, are they sat on the fence and about to go and are going to cost you money down the line because clients want to know that. So, Stu, what about asbestos? I know this is a subject of specialist reports and that kind of thing, but it's something that obviously you would observe and let the customer know about. Yes, uh, certainly with the with older properties, it, uh, it's, it's almost a given when, when you arrive on site and, and look at an old shed that it's asbestos, it, external walls, gutters, roof, internal walls and ceilings. And I've just done one just this weekend, which was the same. So that was a given. And, they, and they'd had an asbestos report already done on the property. But if, for me to go out 
um, you know, in the standard that we work to, we're not specialists in asbestos. We, we, and anybody who is, they go to the property, they take samples, they test them, and then they write the report around the samples. But when you're looking at a property, generally, if it's an older house, uh, pre-1987 is when the, when the code changed for asbestos and, uh, uh, you know, say, we don't want to, we're not going to use this stuff, it's bad for your chest, etc. But it, that then ran out to two, th so in the code it says, and in, in the, when we hand out our, our agreements, which is the Australian standard, it says pre-2003, could be. Wow. Okay. Could be, could it's be. A broad gap, really. Well, isn't it? It, it is, but we don't need to be frightened of it. What we need to look at is certainly with all the properties, it will be in the generally in the wet areas, in the laundries, in the bathrooms, because they use m modern derivatives of that now. They don't use plasterboard in there, they use a modern sort of silica board. Roof coverings, which is easy to tell, um, and in bathrooms, laundries generally. So I would say, I would put a Aspe suspected asbestos materials, say what I think it is, and then in the report it tells you to take the, the, the advice. Okay, Stu, so what about backyards, landscaping, fencing, patio issues? What should we be looking out for there? Well, with your, uh, with your fencing, you're looking to see whether that, that all the palings are in place, and if you give it a gentle push on the, on the fence, it, does it resist lateral loading as in when you're pushing it does it move backwards and forwards landscaping timbers uh, corrosion termite termite infestation anything in contact with the ground that's softwood and oh, even if it's treated if you cut the ends and the ends aren't treated they'll get in okay what about concrete driveways that kind of thing so surely they're rock solid nothing to worry about not always. It depends on the sub base, of, which is what, you know if it's well compacted beneath, uh, and and the and the, the actual thickness of the concrete is correct, and they've not undersized it. Uh, you invariably get a few hairline cracks in driveways and paving over time. We live in a very hot and humid client cl climate, rather, and you know things do move and expand and contract. So hairline cracks is probably just par for the cause, and you just expect that. You sometimes get also what looks like corrosion in the driveway, little ready patches, but that's the aggregate that's in in the ah. driveway part of it. So you know that's nothing really. You look at that as part and parcel of where we live. We've got to use the we've got to use the raw materials that we have. Yeah. But any hairline cracks generally wear and tear. Anything more step cracking it could be subsidence, trip hazards, all those sorts of things could then possibly be more an expensive job to fix. Uh, number ten on your list, finally, but certainly not least, uh, internal water issues. What can we look out for here? Yeah. Well. Uh, Modern properties in the in the bathrooms, they're all they're all waterproofed, and you get a certificate for that to, to say it's waterproofed. It's, it's not to say it's foolproof, but there's very high quality materials these days. But the older the property gets, then you, you, you start to go back to where the, whatever was used may, may have started to fail, or there was nothing at all. And uh, if you've got a shower cubicle and you've got your showers and your waste, if there's any leaks on on the on the pipe work, even if it's weeping, or the tiles are allowing a migration of moisture through, you can then get damp patches and fungal well fungal decay within the timber work and damp patches, say on a hall wall. And then we look at rainwater goods, which we touched on earlier. But we look at rainwater goods. If you've got trees and such like around, you're going to get a lot of uh, leaf debris that's going to be in the roof, uh, in the gutters, etc. They all need to be cleaned. Also, to check the downpipes. You might find that over years, the downpipes have become blocked. So the water's not just a gutter issue, it's a downpipe issue. We've been talking to Stu Marseille about property and pest inspections. Stu, where can we buy the book and find out more details? Propertyinspections, sunshinecoast.com.au.